All right, hello everyone. Um, I'll, you know, I know a few people will just kind of be hopping on as we get started here, but we'll start with some quick, quick housekeeping. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar, a pro-consumer blueprint for advancing system transformation. And we're really excited today because we're going to be discussing how you know we can best continue to embed consumer needs into payment and delivery reform to really ensure that our healthcare system is working for patients. Um, so again, so just a quick housekeeping, um, we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A section in the webinar today. So as questions arise throughout the session, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. There'll also be a chat function where we encourage you to kind of keep the discussion going, but specific questions for our panelists, we do encourage you to use that Q&A function. Um, and if there are any tech issues throughout or you have trouble lo locating any of those things, um, you can send a private message to some of my family's USA colleagues, Nathan Keller and Alicia Kamaliche. Um, and yes, so I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Jane Sheehan, and I am the Deputy Senior Director of Federal Relations here at Families USA. And if anyone's not familiar with our work at Families, we're a leading national voice for healthcare consumers, and we're really dedicated to the achievement of high quality, affordable health, uh, healthcare and improved health for all. So, Again, thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully folks are kind of um, cycling in now. It's really wonderful to you know see how many people registered today and to see so many partners on this webinar to really, you know, again, we're really excited to engage around what it means to center the needs and interests of consumers and patients in reforming healthcare payment and delivery. Um, I think, you know, if you're on today, that means you're either working on these issues already or interested in them. And the consumer advocacy community, including Families USA and others on the webinar today, have been, you know, really working to engage in healthcare system transformation and payment reform for years. Um, back in 2018, Families USA launched the Health Equity Task Force for Payment and Delivery Transformation. And last year, we began working with a, a small group of consumer advocates who are really invested in improving payment um, and delivery of healthcare in the U.S. So. I think before we kind of get into the meat of today's discussion, we also just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, on the federal level, we have seen both the Congress and the administration show some interest over the years in these issues and have taken some steps to enact reforms and, and payment models that seek to realign incentives in our system. I think, for example, we've seen a number of promising payment models come out of CMMI. There have been changes to the physician fee schedule that are seeking to invest more in primary care and community-based care. And we've seen some legislative proposals that are aiming to incentivize participation in alternative payment models and in primary care. But as uh, we will discuss today, there is much more work to do. Um, so that kind of brings us um, to kind of getting a, a little more into the discussion. So just last week, Families USA, in collaboration with the American Heart Association, Third Way, the National Partnership for Women and Families, and the National Consumers League, published a brand new policy agenda that details principles that are gonna be integral to consumer focused payment and delivery reform. Um, we're really excited today to, you know, kind of building on that uh, agenda release to discuss the importance of payment reform with you all and to talk through the agenda with some of our core partners here, Sarah Coombs, the Director of Health System Transformation at the National Partnership for Women and Families, and Melanie Phelps, who is a senior advocacy advisor for health system transformation at the American Heart Association. So before we get into that discussion and a little bit of background on why we came together, we wanted to kind of ground this conversation in the patient experience. So we're going to hear from Catherine Horine, who is a consumer and patient advocate from Illinois, who through her experience battling multiple chronic conditions, has come face to face with some of the failings of our healthcare system. So um, now we're going to kind of share a, a short message from Catherine, and then we'll get a little bit more into the meat of the discussion. Rated my nine-year anniversary. On okay, so I'm a lung transplant recipient. I just celebrated my nine-year anniversary on November 3rd. It's not an easy process. I was actually turned down by one of the local hospitals in Chicago that does lung transplants because I was too complicated of a case. So I did not know that that could happen. I just figured my doctor referred me. I needed a lung transplant and that they would take me and that's not the case. I had to wait a couple of months before I could even get in to see somebody. 
and I was progressively getting worse. I initially um, had all these symptoms. I was coughing. In fact, I coughed hard enough that I cracked four ribs. Um, and I called my primary care physician because I thought I had a cold. You, you know, it starts there. So you go to the primary care physician, prescribes medication for, you know, like bronchitis, you know. So we go through two rounds of that that's not working. Then he sends me for a chest x-ray. That was negative. I'm still coughing and getting worse by the minute. And he finally, and this was over a period of at least six weeks. Finally, after none of those worked, he sent me to, to my regular local hospital that I go to where most of my doctors are, um, but does not do transplants. And he said, I want you to go to the ER and I want you to get admitted. And I was admitted to the hospital and via the ER, um, ended up staying there for approximately 10 days um, and the pulmonologist slash critical care specialist that I saw in the ER was assigned to my case and he would see me on the floor. They ran every test known to man and could not figure out what was wrong with me um, and actually came to my room one day after I'd been there a week at least and my mother was there, thank goodness, to tell me that I was dying. But he had a doctor, a colleague up at Mayo, um, who if I could get there with by the day after tomorrow, um, he had agreed to see me. So I go, so my two, two of my brothers, you know, get on the computer, start booking flights to Mayo. And that's the first time I heard the word transplant. That doctor looked at my records I brought he looked at the testing that they did and he said to me if you and this was February of 2014 but I'd already been sick since November if you don't get a lung transplant before the end of the year you won't survive and that's the first time I heard the word transplant once you get accepted and you go through all the pre-testing and um, all the meetings you have to go to and that's where they scare the heck out of you and <laughs> tell you all this, all the bad stuff that can, could, might happen to you. The doctor who's the head of the lung transplant department, um, at, when he first met me, his words, you know, still ring in my ear to this day. And his words were, I want you to know that while a lung transplant can be a life-saving procedure, you need to know you are trading one disease state for another. And then once a year around the time of my anniversary, I get a letter with a list a mile long of additional testing that I need to do every year. I see my transplant doctor every three months. Um, I, uh, I see my neurologist twice a year because I have epilepsy. Um, so, um, and my primary care makes me come see him once a year um, and um, I have three cardiologists um, if that doesn't make everybody laugh I don't know what will but I got a really good lung and I have a really good team and I'm a really good patient and so it's now nine years plus and um, still going strong what I would want people to know is that I am more than a lung transplant recipient I'm a person with multiple health problems, but I'm also a person with a cat, brothers, hobbies, friends, support group. I'm a person who volunteers, fundraises, advocates, fights for change, and can now climb 1,640 stairs in under an hour, thanks to lots of hard work and overcoming many, many obstacles. Okay, so I'm great. Well, I just want to give Catherine just a huge thanks for sharing her story. And I believe she was planning to be on today. So hopefully people can show her some love in, in the chat. Um, so I mean, I think, unfortunately, healthcare consumers across the country have shared Catherine's experience of being bounced between providers waiting for care while symptoms worsen and really just navigating the complex system. Um, I, just, I loved what she said at the end, you know, she's more than a lung transplant recipient. She's more than her symptoms or conditions. And 
I think unfortunately our system is often just looking at at patients and and, and people that way. They're they're um, they're looked at as just kind of a, a combination of symptoms and not as kind of the the whole people that they are. So very simply, as we're going to talk through today in a few different ways, our healthcare system is often failing to meet the needs of consumers. Um, so on this slide here, we can kind of unpack that a little bit. First of all, I think healthcare in the United States, not a shock to anyone on this line probably, is extremely expensive and, and so much so that over 100 million Americans face some form of medical debt and nearly half of all adults report that it's difficult to afford their healthcare costs. So high costs and medical debt have an even greater impact, of course, as we know, on Black and Hispanic communities who are facing even greater barriers accessing care due to cost due to systemic economic disadvantages. And even when consumers are able to pay for their care, they're still forced to grapple with navigating an extremely complex system. Um, you know, we can all I think relate to this difficulties identifying a provider in network, finding a provider with adequate availability, and then coordinating those healthcare appointments make it really difficult for most consumers to see a provider when they need to. And I think there are statistics out there that U.S. adults often spend the equivalent of an entire workday each month just trying to coordinate health care for themselves or a loved one. And this rate can be even higher for rural or marginalized communities who are most vulnerable to the impacts of provider shortages and network inadequacies. So despite all of this money and time spent, we also know that the U.S. has some of the worst health outcomes amongst comparable nations. Um, a quarter of U.S. adults report receiving poor quality care, but we don't need survey results to tell us this because our health outcomes speak for themselves. And approximately 87 out of every 100,000 deaths in the U.S. are amenable, meaning that those deaths would not have occurred if timely and effective health care was provided. We also in the U.S. have the highest infant and maternal mortality rates, and with that disparities amongst other comparable nations as well. So why, how are we here and, and what do we want to talk through today in terms of solutions? So we know that, you know, driving issues around cost, quality and access are perverse incentives that are embedded in our healthcare payment and delivery model. Fee for service, which is the predominant payment model in US healthcare, and under fee for service, patients are billed for every individual service, which is therefore incentivizing providers to, you know, make, make money by providing more high cost services rather than simply providing the services that are gonna to lead to the patient's best health. That's baked into our system. And on top of this, a lot of care that helps really improve health and prevent illness like primary care visits, behavioral health services, and services to address social drivers of health are undervalued or not paid for at all under this system. I think it's been established that 80 to 90% of what is really driving differences in our health are socioeconomic and environmental factors, like our access to an ability to afford healthy food, uh, education, rely on transportation. And unfortunately, little to no payment is offered for you know, the services that are gonna help people overcome these social drivers. So because of this, um, and we're gonna walk through a couple slides right now with these principles and then have a discussion, but it's really critical for policymakers that are talking about, you know, advancing the movement towards value-based care and, and holding providers and major health systems kind of, you know, more accountable and, and making sure they're reimbursed for actually improving um, patient health outcomes and addressing inequities. We need to really make sure policymakers are paying attention and that we're focused on, you know, again, improving outcomes and addressing inequities rather than just promoting high volumes of high price services. So, I, I'll just say again, it's, I'm excited to see so many partners on today and engaging because it's really imperative that consumer and patient advocates are in this space and are keeping policymakers focused to really be a counterweight to stakeholders that are just invested in keeping the status quo. So that brings us uh, to these policy principles. So, you know, as, as you can see here, our, our collective organizations, Families USA, the American Heart Association, the National Partnership for Women and Families, National Consumers League, and Third Way. Uh, have worked to develop six policy principles that we feel will really go towards advancing real payment reform that can help us reorient economic incentives to hold our healthcare system accountable. So we have a few on this slide and then a few on the next slide. And, um, you know, depending if people are kind of more visual or, or verbal learners, um, we'll, we'll just kind of quickly go through all of them and we can definitely uh, share these and follow up too. So first we have a principle around 
really making sure we're improving health outcomes by changing payment incentives to improve health, reduce inequities, and prioritize the delivery of high value care over volume of services. Next, we're focused on strengthening primary care, behavioral health, and long-term care systems by investing in services that keep people healthy, address chronic illness, and prevent the need to use more expensive care settings. Then we want to ensure that strong patient protections and guardrails in healthcare payment systems are ensuring medically underserved patients, patients with chronic illness, and patients with disabilities have full and complete access to high quality and culturally congruent care and services. And just have a few more um, on the next slide here. Uh, next, we want to establish national data sharing, interoperability, and quality measurement standards to reduce waste, enable real-time coordination of services across health sectors, and drive meaningful improvements in health equity and health outcomes. We want to be promoting healthy competition in U.S. healthcare markets to support meaningful access to high quality care and services. And finally, last but not least, we want to improve consumer and other stakeholder access to meaningful information about treatment options, quality of care, patient experience and cost to enable effective decision making and improve consumer and community input into the design, implementation and evaluation of policies and programs. So recognizing that was a lot to just run through. We do encourage you, if you haven't yet, to read the full agenda, which is you know, entitled a, a pro-consumer policy agenda to achieve meaningful health system transformation. Um, I believe the link's gonna be thrown in the chat. It's on the Families USA website. And now before we get into our panel discussion, just a little bit of audience engagement, um, I think we're gonna throw up a poll and just recognizing we just went through six pretty, pretty big um, principles here. You know, if, if we want to kind of see with the audience right now, which one is resonating the most in this moment? Um, I think in the poll, unfortunately, you can only choose one, but recognizing that hopefully more than one is is um, is really resonating with you. But we just kind of wanted to do this quick poll. And I think they're going to be I see some questions in the chat about what can you remind us what those principles are? I think they should be in the poll itself. And I can't in this moment see the poll. So bear with us if that's not up yet. And I think we'll well, here, here it is right now. Um, so folks can just take a minute to do that. And as everyone is doing that, I think we are going to introduce our panel. Um, and I'm already seeing some folks participating here. So I'm seeing there it's, it's variating by the minute, which is actually really great to see because I think it shows that there's interest across these and the importance of all these really together as a, as a single unit. Um, so um, again, we're going to now move into our panel discussion with you know two of the, the co-authors and, and organizations that contributed to this policy agenda. We have Sarah Coombs from the National Partnership on Women and Families and Melanie Phelps from the American Heart Association. So I think I am going to maybe pull down the poll in case that's still up for everybody. And then that way we can kind of get into the discussion, but um, really appreciate everyone participating in this. And I'm going to, maybe I, I can share the results, cool. Okay, so we're going to take a quick look at that. Um, but as folks can are looking at that, let's just dive right in. So Sarah and Melanie, thank you both for being here. We're really excited about this conversation and kind of the continued work with you all about centering the consumer voice in payment and delivery reform. Um, so I might just start with kind of an opening question for you both so we can kind of begin this discussion. I think if you could both speak to why, you know, you and your organizations feel the need to be involved in this movement towards value-based care, true value-based care, and how you see the agenda and these principles kind of fitting in um, with, with those efforts. And why don't we start with Melanie, because you're off mute. <laughs> Thank you, Jane, and thanks to Families USA for convening this, um, this effort. It's uh, very important. So just a little bit about the Heart Association. We are celebrating our 100th anniversary in June. And we are the nation's oldest and largest voluntary organization that is dev devoted to fighting cardiovascular disease and stroke. Uh, and interestingly, we are the number one funder of research outside the federal government, having invested um, well over three and a half billion dollars over the years. Um, our mission is to be a relentless force for a world of longer, healthier lives. And our vision is advancing health and hope for everyone everywhere. 
And we believe that everyone deserves the opportunity for a longer, healthier life. <laughs> so that's our, our starting point. And despite all the advances in science and medicine that we have contributed to and others have contributed to, and despite the fact that the U.S. spends far more per capita on healthcare than any other country, we really do perform poorly on most um, population health measures, as you pointed out earlier. And our health disparities are particularly shocking. Um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality and morbidity. And um, after years of improvement, that, those trends are starting to reverse. And we do see a lot of disparities in cardiovascular mortality and uh, morbidity as, as well. So um, our, our sad conclusion is that the healthcare system has failed on many levels. And if we are to realize our mission, then it's absolutely imperative that we include a focus on health system transformation. Um, we need to move away from our relying on fee for service with its perverse incentives to do uh, more, not better. Uh, and create a new system that rewards and focuses on optimizing the health of individuals and populations and improving the care delivery system to be more holistic and person-centered. And um, needed services need to be more affordable too. So um, it is significant that the most important voice, the end user, the consumers, the patients, um, have largely been left out of discussions about um, health system transformation and new payment and care delivery models. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, not the least of which is this stuff is really confusing, but we need to do better. And it is absolutely imperative that um, more patient and consumer advocates um, are able to get behind an agenda to do better um, across the board uh, to make a, our healthcare system something that um, works for everyone. So, great, thank you so much, Melanie. Sarah, um, same question to you, and happy to repeat it if if helpful. <laughs> Sure, no, that's fine. So for those of you who are not aware um, of the National Partnership, we are a, a policy and advocacy organization dedicated to health and economic justice for all women, people, and families. And one of our core areas of focus is shaping healthcare payment and delivery system reform that centers consumer priorities and promotes health equity. And the National Partnership was one of the first consumer advocacy organizations to be involved in this movement over a decade ago. We were one of the founding members of the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, also known as the LAN, um, that was created to bring together partners in the public private and nonprofit sectors to transform our nation's healthcare system towards value-based care. Um, we're also part of the Healthcare Transformation Task Force and many other groups in this effort. We've, you know, we've always believed like, you know, Families USA and American Heart that we need to change how care is provided, who provides that care, and how to pay for care that individuals and communities want and need, especially those who are dealing with the poorest, most inequitable health outcomes. And as Jane pointed out, we've seen decades of evidence to show that the uh, that the under the predominant fee for service payment system, there's just been little incentive to provide person centered care and strive for better results. And so simply put, like our healthcare system is just not designed to reward success in promoting the health, well-being, and financial security of our communities, um, really irrespective of many of like our healthcare providers' best intentions and best interests, right? So we have to change healthcare's fundamental payment structures to support transforming healthcare delivery and place the needs of people and families at the center. And as Melanie pointed out, unfortunately, until more recent efforts, consumer and patient advocates and beneficiaries and caregivers have historically been marginalized in these policy conversations. You know, we, like the collective we, have not been meaningfully engaged in the design, implementation, and evaluation of models, and the vast majority of payment reform efforts haven't really been successful at measuring the impacts of value-based care beyond cost savings. And, um, and for sure, you know, prior to a couple of years ago, racial, ethnic, gender, and other systemic inequities were not even explicitly addressed in these payment reforms. So that's why the National Partnership has long been an advocate in the space, and we support the policy principles that are outlined in this collective policy agenda. 
We also believe in holding space for and bringing in more consumer and health equity advocates like many of you on this call into this important work, particularly now as there's unprecedented efforts made by CMS, private payers, providers, multi-stakeholder groups, and engaging with beneficiaries, caregivers, and advocates um, to leverage value-based care to improve quality, equity, and patient experience, and hopefully affordability too. Wow, great. Thank you, Sarah and Melanie, for just kind of kicking us off there. I think I totally agree with essentially everything that's already been said already. I think as we've already discussed here, consumers and patients and, and families are, are grappling and have been grappling with the system that's failing to meet their needs. And, you know, we know healthcare is more expensive. We know our outcomes are are, are not as bright as, as other nations. And I think what you were just saying, Sarah, kind of leads me to kind of a follow-up question and around kind of some of the past efforts. And we know that certain models of what have in the past been framed as value-based care have failed to really move away from fee-for-service, have failed to move away from, you know, our, our current payment model and, and the perverse incentives within that. I think, you know, we've seen that happen with Medicare Advantage and Medicaid Managed Care. So I think, you know, for both of you, and maybe we'll start with Melanie again, you know, in what ways can policymakers really ensure that when we're talking about, you know, current and future models, we're truly incentivizing providers to provide high quality equitable care. And we're not just kind of leaning back again on, on fee-for-service. Yeah, so the problem with Medicare Advantage and Medicaid Managed Care being um, termed value-based contracts is that that's not the type of value-based contracts we're usually talking about. We're talking about holding the providers that provide care um, more accountable because those are the people that know their patients. They know the communities in, in which they practice. They can, they have a better understanding of how uh, healthcare dollars need to be distributed. So, you know, we have to be very careful when we are talking about value-based care. What exactly do we mean? And I think the provider accountability um, for cost, quality, and um, and affordability is um, is uh, central. Yeah, Thank you, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with Melanie. I mean, she took the words right out of my mouth. I think um, accountability is is really is fundamentally accountability is like is a key pillar of value based uh, of a value based payment system. And we also believe that to deliver on the promise of value based care, healthcare providers and payers must be accountable to patients and their caregivers for the the quality, cost, and, and equity of care. Um, and we know that CMS um, has been working to refine existing models and strengthen payment incentives and, and future models to um, support more person-centered care and to advance um, equity and, and support care delivery transformations that address the pressing needs of patients and communities like, um, you know, providing financial supports for read readily accessible, culturally responsive and team-based care um, that looks like care that includes like non-physician and, and, and ancillary providers like community health workers, nurse coordinators, pharmacists, and others, um, as well as care coordination across providers, you know, integrating um, behavioral health and, and specialty care, much like what Catherine was describing that she lacked was that integration with specialty and primary care, right? Um, and you know we see examples of this in new models of care, like the voluntary making care primary model that is set to be launched this summer. Um, we, I'm happy to share more details about that that model. But there's lots of exciting things happening at the center um, of innovation, and I think um, you know I, I think that to your point, there's so much that can be done to really uh, truly incentivize providers to provide high quality care. Jane, can I just clarify something Please. for a moment? So um, I just don't want to leave the impression that I am not aware that under Medicare Advantage and under Medicaid Managed Care, um, that there aren't efforts underway to um, partner with providers um, in you know new payment and care delivery models. There, there are. So I would include those arrangements as a subset <laughs> that are value-based value care. 
So, and I, my own aunt who I care for, I have an 80 year old aunt with an intellectual disability. I have her rolled in an MA program. And, you know, if I didn't know, if I wasn't in health system transformation, I would not have known how to navigate to a provider that was in one of those um, arrangements. And while it's not perfect, it's better than any care that I have had um, experience with um, since I started being her caregiver 26 years ago. Great, thank you, Melanie, for both, I think, clarifying and sharing that bit of, you know, kind of a, a personal story here. And I, I think I appreciate, you know, both of your answers to that question. I, when we're looking at kind of existing, um, you know, efforts, you know, under under both Medicare Advantage, managed, Medicaid Managed Care and elsewhere, again, just going back to that, that utilizing fee-for-service uh, means that the same incentives are often driving those programs. And I think some models in the past have really failed to have adequate patient guardrails, like effective risk adjustment, to really make sure that providers are treating medically vulnerable populations, um, that, you know, th that they're not penalized and, and that patients aren't turned away because of that. So I think that's just another piece of it, too, that we wanted to lift up. And um, now, I, I think I want to change gears slightly and talk a little bit more about data collection and utilization and, and, and that piece of it. So, Sarah, I know you've, you and a national partnership have thought long and hard about this. We can start with you. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, the role that data collection, utilization, and publication play in improving care for consumers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we can all agree that data collection and appropriate sharing plays a critical role for um, in, in quality improvement and for enabling real time coordination of healthcare services across uh, healthcare providers and organizations. Um, data collection is also critical for identifying inequities, um, targeting resources to address them, measuring progress, and supporting uh, transparency and, and accountability initiatives. Um, we actually actually conducted recently um, a landscape study um, on maternity care APMs, uh, alternative payment models. And we found that um, health systems, um, a few healthcare systems actually collect and, and track maternity care outcomes data that are disaggregated and stratified by race and ethnicity, um, never mind like other key demographic uh, data like disability and social status, right? The, this makes it really impossible to measure inequities and hold providers accountable for achieving better results. Um, but we have been encouraged by CMS's commitment to improve data collection and sharing. I think almost all of um, the new models announced by CMS um, provide support or upfront payments for data infrastructure and, and require data collection and reporting on key socioeconomic factors. We continue to push for self-reported data as an institutional and organizational priority for all healthcare stakeholders, but we also recognize that there are technical and operational challenges. That's why, um, you know, investments are needed uh, for that data, connect data collection. It's also important that, um, you know, as we're increasing efforts for data collection and sharing that, you know, we also understand that patients dis distrust and discomfort in disclosing like sensitive information. And that needs to be addressed. And that could you know, look like requiring or, or sharing best practices uh, for data collection that honors you know, patients' dignity and, and builds trust. Um, also, you know, as there are increased efforts to make refer referrals um, to community-based organizations, you know, as social needs are identified, I think we have to think about you know, what does that mean for community-based organizations and their capacity? to address those social needs and and what does community investment and par partnership look like and and how do we you know how do we look to and integrate um, models like community care hubs for instance you know these are you know community focused entities that support a network of cbo's and contracting with like healthcare entities to provide services to social needs so i think we need to just you know, I, all of these efforts are great and laudable. We also want to ensure that we're doing them in a way that actually supports communities um, in the way that they need the support. Yeah, I totally agree with Sarah. And I would just add that there's a need for some standardization of, of the data so that, you know, you can make apples to apples com comparisons. Um, and so that, um, you know, it is less administratively burdensome burdensome if you have uh, standardized collection and data and sharing. And and then the, the whole other thing about the sharing piece is, you know, here we are um, four, 
uh, 15 years after the um, era funding and the meaningful use, and we're still not, the um, EHR systems are still not talking and sharing. I mean, we have HIEs all over the place, but, you know, I mentioned my aunt a little while ago. Um, we, we don't know if she's had her shingle shots. Now, that's crazy <laughs> that we can't um, figure that out. Um, and that's just a very small example of, you know, how patient care can be hurt because um, we're probably going to get her another round of sing shingle shots, not knowing whether she's had those. And, and that could be, a, you know, a lot worse <laughs> an example. But, you know, we we need to do better on so many levels on the data data collection and utilization and sharing. So, yeah, I just, you know, I, Melanie, I couldn't agree more. And I just, I also just wanted to add like patient experience. I think that's, um, you know, something that we similarly need to focus on as well. I think both, you know, while both patient reported outcomes and patient experience measures are, are well known, I think they're just not, they're not universally being used. And I think that this data is so important for quality improvement. And again, there are operational challenges in collecting this data. So there is a need for um, investment in, in value-based pay models, payment models to specifically um, uh, address and advance patient experience implementation, design, and evaluation. Um, so yeah, and I think like as we go about, you know, thinking about what a different paradigm or payment data paradigm looks like to improve health and outcomes and experience. We also believe that we need to, you know, have it. I think that also needs to require an examination of like how we measure things like respect, dignity, and trust. Definitely great. Absolutely. Thank you both. I mean, I think you both lifted up so many important pieces and I, you know, I think with, with, with data, with transparency, with interoperability, different kinds of data, we can't really hold the health system accountable for the care it's providing unless we have we have that transparency and, and look inside to patient experience, quality, quality outcomes. So this data is really pivotal to ensuring that patients are, are able to get care they need. And I know there's the price, there's the price transparency aspect of it too, of course. But you know, I think that again, I just really appreciate everything you both just said, especially in terms of how it fits in with health equity and how you know high quality stratified and detailed data is, is a important step and an important kind of piece of how we're gonna be able to tackle these issues head on and really hold the system accountable for the care that it's providing and, and then target policies, of course, to kind of the root of some of these inequities. Um, so I think we kind of also along the, on the same lines transition a bit, um, talking a little bit more about issues with you know, we can't really talk about cost, cost and quality without talking a little more directly about in inequities that are kind of embedded within our current system and embedded within fee for service. Um, you know, we've uh, kind of shared a couple stats already, and I think some of these are unfortunately just really familiar to, to many of us um, when we're talking about black maternal and infant mortality and, and rates at nearly three times higher than for white moms and babies when we're looking, um, you know, at a lot of these just like disproportionate. Um, communities being disproportionately hit by medical debt, you know, I, I think we see these statistics and stories, uh, you know, very often and 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 these, these stories are not going away. So I think, you know, for both of you and Sarah, maybe we'll, we'll start with you again this time when we're thinking about, you know, the pursuit of health equity and 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 healthier, you know, a healthier nation, how how do you kind of see payment reform as being a key part of that? And you've talked about this a bit already, but this is an opportunity to really underline your points here. Yeah, I mean, we see payment reform as a key lever, and, you know, it's not the only uh, lever, but it's a key lever to advance equity. And I think, as you reference maternal health, um, you know, I'm really excited about the new transforming maternity health model that was recently announced. And I'm not sure how many of you in the audience were able to tune into today's uh, CMMI webinar, but yeah, that's the newest, um, a new, the newest CMS model designed to focus exclusively on improving outcomes and experiences for pregnant and postpartum people uh, with a focus on reducing health inequities. And um, that particular model will launch next year, but it will support up to 15 states in um, their development of a whole person approach to pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum care. Um, that really takes into account like physical, mental health and social needs. And, um, you know, the partnership has been 
obviously a long advocate for maternity care transformation. Um, and we have long championed some of the, the policies or um, components to that model, like increasing access to midwives, birth centers, doulas, and perinatal community health workers, uh, providing risk assessments, referrals, and follow-ups for perinatal depression, anxiety, um, substance use disorder, and health-related social needs, um, delivering personalized care that is consistent with individual values, preferences, and needs, and investing in data infrastructure to support data collection sh and sharing to reach health equity goals. You know, there are, there are many more components to that model, but we think altogether, there's a real promise to improve maternal health equity and, and outcomes um, in the U.S. and to really help address this maternal maternity care crisis. And so we encourage all of you to, to take a look into that model. And we're help, we're also happy to be a resource. But I think, you know, I think, you know, generally, even beyond uh, maternity care, in addition to data collection efforts and and, and efforts, um, uh, data collection efforts, I think I think there's a there's a need to um, think about also how to how to target safety net providers and CMS has really been uh, really been taking up a lot of intentionality in including rural independent safety net safety net community providers um, into these into value-based care and offering them you know increased learning support and important financial resources so that their their patients can also, be included in these high value, high care, high quality care models, um, because these, these communities have system, systemically been under-resourced and haven't had access to these models in the past, or these providers have been penalized um, because they have a disproportionate amount of patients that have high needs, right? Um, so I think, you know, there's there's a lot that value-based payment can do in the equity space. And we're just really excited. I think, I think I'll just end with saying that we we have a strong desire to see, you know, equity measures transition from pay for for reporting to performance. Um, you know, we we want to see incentives for providers to reduce gaps in quality of care and health outcomes. Um, and so I think that's what, you know, we're, you know, that's the next step. I think over time, we're, we're hoping that um, there will be some incentives to reduce gaps in, 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 in outcomes and, and close disparities. And I will echo everything that um, Sarah says. We, we really believe that these new payment and care delivery models offer the opportunity to have a greater focus on um, addressing health inequities through measurement, but even more um, importantly, through the ability to deploy services that are not currently deployable under fee for service, you know, to provide those um, that that uh, team based care and those personalized services, those community health workers. Um, there's just, you know, so many opportunities that, again, do not exist in fee-for-service that we have the ability to shape um, to address those things that we believe are, are important. So um, I did see earlier that somebody was concerned about, you know, the power dynamics. And I, I, if it's okay, I would like to address that because if you're not on the table if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, all right? That's something that I've always um, held firm. And, you know, consumer and patient advocacy uh, groups have not been at this table. And the, we have a lot of power. Um, we just haven't figured out how to use it yet. And so I think that this agenda helps set the foundation for us to come together and really use the our collective voices um, to you know have a seat at at that table. So we're not on the menu. So we're helping drive. Um, we're helping determine <laughs> the menu. So great, thank you, Melanie, for lifting that up, and and, and Sarah for kind of your your previous um, just really very clear kind of walk through the the many different ways that we can payment reform can you know be be a positive force when we're addressing inequities and yeah i think i, I would just echo what melanie was saying in terms of power balance I, there will there will always be kind of the status quo and in various industry uh groups and entities that that don't want to kind of see the system change that are very happy with fee-for-service and 
it does often, it is a, a big power imbalance, but collectively, like that's, that's what we want to keep doing with you all. And I think, you know, as, as time goes on, we want to find additional ways to engage together, to engage with the administration, to engage with policymakers, to engage with plants, to make sure that these efforts are not leaving patients behind. Um, and I think I just want to lift up kind of one more piece um, of what, you know, both Sarah and Melanie were saying around um, health inequities and, and, and communities and how, you know, our current system doesn't really recognize that connection. And I think we know that health and health inequities start in the community and being able to reimburse and integrate services like navigators, translation services, community health workers, housing supports, and, and more within our health system is going to help better meet the needs of populations and um, address inequities that, that, that are, you know, kind of that are driving poor health outcomes for marginalized and medically vulnerable populations. So we have about 15 minutes left. And I know I've seen a couple questions pop up in the chat that I was also kind of planning to kind of, we've also teased a little bit out. So why don't we get kind of, we'll get started on those and again, encourage people to go into the chat. So uh, we, in terms of like CMMI models, what we've been seeing coming out very recently that we're excited about, Melanie and Sarah, you both kind of touched on a few of them. We talked about, um, you know, maternal health and primary care models that have come out. Uh, do you, do either of you want to say like a little bit more about either of those or additional models that you think are worth paying attention to and engaging around? Sure. I think there was some a chat, a question in a chat about the making care primary model. I mean, I think um, that model is a voluntary model. It, it will be launched this summer um, and it will only be tested in eight states, but I feel I still think it's a really great opportunity and an unprecedented opportunity um, or investment in primary care and one of the ways to really address the urgent primary care crisis. Um, the model will provide a pathway for primary care practices to gradually move away from fee-for-service reimbursements towards um, more upfront flexible payments that are tied to quality um, and that will support um, you know, providing whole person care and wraparound services mm -hmm. in, in ways that, you know, retros retrospective fee-for-service reimbursement cannot. Um, you know, this could look like, you know, sending community health workers to visit patients at home to manage their chronic care conditions, for example. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise within that model, and there are a lot of health equity components that we are very supportive of. Um, and I think in terms of like the states, in case those are folks are curious, those include um, Colorado, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Mexico, New Jersey, North Carolina, um, upstate New York, and Washington. And I'd like to uh, draw attention to the guide model, which um, addresses dementia care patients. This is the first model that CMS really sought the input of um, patients and caregivers. Um, and I think that that is um, that's something that we're going to see uh, more of because of CMMIs and the administration's commitment to engaging um, patients and their their families. Uh, in the development of these models, so. Great, thank you both. And I think um, I, I those were those are both models that we were gonna lift up too. I think an initial one, um, there's a, a cell and gene therapy model for patients with sickle cell disease, um, innovations in behavioral health model and, and many others. So I think we wanna um, kind of continue to be able to lift those up for people. I, as I think Sarah had mentioned, CMMI actually had a Kind of a, an educational call uh, a little earlier today where they did walk through i think it's a maternal health model so as we see opportunities and and um and you know opportunities to engage with the administration on that we definitely want to lift those up for this group too so that we're kind of all getting that as much information as we can um we have, we have a little bit more time left and i've seen a couple of questions come in now through the chat so keep throwing them in there if you can and if we don't get to everything we can definitely um, make sure that we're following up and answering some of these questions for folks. So I do see one um, kind of around bundled payment models, um, particularly, you know, should we continue to explore bundled payment models, for maternity care and heart health in particular? Are there certain specialties for which bundled payment models work better than for others? And I think Melanie and Sarah, you obviously both have some expertise around um, maternal health and heart health. So um, if one of you wants to jump in with that first. I'll start. I mean, bundled payments, while not absolutely ideal, because they don't look at 
the total cost of care and everything else that might be going on with that patient, they're absolutely a necessary step to engage the specialist because that's um, something that we're all struggling with. How do you engage the specialists in, in these models? So I'm looking forward to seeing how um, the hybrid models are at, by nesting the, the bundles and the episodes um, into the more longitudinal um, population-based models. Yeah, and um, I agree. I mean, I think there are lots of um, opportunities uh, within maternity care payment models and also maternity care uh, maternity care homes to improve maternal health outcomes and reduce inequities. Um, I'll share with you all a commentary that we just released in, in Health Affairs um, regarding that study that I had previously mentioned on our landscape study of maternity care APMs. Um, I think, you know, I think what we learned is that um, there just, there hasn't been, um, there's been just missed opportunities to use those um, alternative payment models to really improve outcomes and, and, and advance equity. Um, but we, I think we've identified some really great recommendations in the report that I'm happy to share that um, supports uh, prime, you know, these APM managers to identify ways to really improve um, uh, the improve results and improve outcomes and improve equity. Um, but yeah, no, we're we're told, we're definitely excited for the TEMA model, which will have a payment component, um, not immediately, but later in the implement in the um, implementation period. And I think um, I think we're just excited for you know, providers and payers to leverage uh, alternative payment payments to improve maternity care. Great, thank you both. Um, I see a couple more, we might be able to get to one or two more questions here. So, you know, I, I think I, I see a question here from Robert Hall around, you know, older Americans in particular. And, you know, he, he's referencing that his state has been having a lot of debate over healthcare costs related to retirees and their families. Um, I, I don't know if either of you want to tackle this, I'm happy to jump into, but I think when we're talking about payment reform efforts and maybe models in particular, how you know how are we seeing them help with help help with older adults and, and their healthcare needs and navigating the system? I'll, Melanie, I'll, do you want to start? I mean, so Medicare is the one that's leading the the charge on this for some reason. Um, I know it's kind of co counterintuitive, but the innovator in healthcare um, has always been Medicare. And where Medicare goes, the private payer goes. And so the uh, the models that uh, th there are more opportunities in Medicare um, than in Medicaid or in in commercial. So, yeah, I, th I think that's that's absolutely right. And I mean, we do know that again. I think Medicare can be an innovator, and Medicare can definitely drive what both Medicaid and the commercial market are kind of looking to do. So. I think that can be a great tool. And I think we, we talked a little bit already about the guide model and that's very specific to dementia patients, but that um, you know, certainly kind of helps with some older adults and their needs. So let's see. Um, so I, I see a couple questions in the chat again about really lifting up the importance of how payment reform can impact health equity. And I know we've talked a little bit about that in addition to kind of how um, you know, community providers, community health workers, social workers, et cetera, how integral they can be. Um, I think just you know maybe this um, this one kind of tail end of this question about health equity, as as advocates, how can we really make sure that models going forward, payment for efforts going forward, are actually following through on that on that promise of health equity? And that is a, a broad question, and I'm sure there's a lot that both of you could say. But if there's any kind of um, anything that just pops to mind that maybe we haven't covered yet, or just to underline again for for the audience. We're just going to have to follow what goes on. I mean, you know, there's got in the evaluations, um, we're going to have to pay attention and we're going to have to be ready to um, advocate or um, for improvements or praise them when it's done well. Um, you know, we just can't let somebody else do it. If it's a priority for us, um, then we've got to be engaged. I completely agree, Melanie. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we we're going to want to see, um, you know, on the account, the accountability piece, we, we're going to want to see me measures on equity, paying for equity. Um, you know, we're we're very pleased to see, you know, CMS supporting expanded care teams that can address equity 
Um, obviously, addressing social needs and integrating community health, social care, that's really important. Um, but yeah, in terms of our engagement, I think we all need to engage with CMS and the, in the, in the Innovation Center, whether in small group meetings or listening sessions, so that they can directly hear your voice and your feedback um, and recommendations. We can also advocate on behalf of patients, caregivers, and communities. Um, you know, by staying engaged with the federal rulemaking process, right? There are, um, we can strategically use um, the federal comment periods or opportunities to, to highlight um, consumer and patient needs and priorities. And then also, I would just encourage groups to stay connected with the Families USA, American Heart, the National Partnership, and other groups that have really been engaged in this space. And, you know, we're happy to continue to lift up um, the advocacy, advocacy community priorities, but we also just want to welcome others to join. Yes, we need everybody uh, joining together with us in this uh, in, endeavor. And, you know, it's not just at the federal level. This is also happening at the state level because Medicaid is, is a huge piece of this. And then um, commercial, um, we should be demanding this of our em employers. Um, and, you know, we also should be working with our healthcare organizations on how to better meet the needs of the communities that, that they serve, because that's not something that, that healthcare has done well at any level. So, and it goes, you know, all the way from the macro level with the federal government, all the way down to the, or the organizational uh, level in the communities, um, that patient, that consumer advocacy voice needs to, to be heard um, and engaged. And sometimes we're going to have to demand that we're at the table if we're not invited. Beautifully said for, for both of you. I mean, I like those, those could be like perfect, perfectly scripted closing thoughts, but I, I do want to give you both just an opportunity as like kind of a wrapping up. If there's anything else that you want kind of our attendees today to take away knowing, I think we've heard a lot just about the importance of staying engaged and, uh, you know, seeking out opportunities when, you know, our organizations or others are lifting up opportunities, get engaged, be at the table. Um, but Sarah and Melanie, any kind of final, final thoughts from you all? Sure. I mean, I think um, as you all demonstrated so nicely at the beginning of this webinar, you be grounded this conversation in patient experiences. We need more patient stories. Um, I think that is going to be um, what really drives uh, this this movement in a meaningful way. I think we cannot do this without uh, patients and caregivers and hearing from them, and, and that's why we double down on patient experiences um, in this in this conversation. Um, I think that you know one of the one of the things I just wanted to highlight was that for those of you that are probably less familiar with value based care or for um, you know, folks in your community, there's the new value-based care spotlight that CMMI just launched on their website. It's a really great re resource to kind of get familiar with value-based care concepts. Um, they've also highlighted patient stories, which, you know, really highlights the impact of value-based care. Um, they also have um, tailored pages for the general public, but also providers and in, in their education of value-based care. So yeah, definitely encourage everyone. And I'm happy to drop that um, in the chat. And I agree. We just need everyone to, to pay attention and be involved. And both Sarah and I are working together yet separately on efforts to, to make the language around value-based care uh, more accessible um, to the patient and consumer communities. Um, because usually when we talk about value-based care, we go into really technical jargon and people's eyes glaze over and we send them into an information coma. We got to do better. We got to um, put ourselves in the, um, in the, um, from the, we have to treat this from the position of a patient or a, a consumer and talk about it in a way that is meaningful to them. And um, we are currently working on efforts to, to do that. So, you know, just stay tuned. Um, we, we promise we will we'll help um, make this discussion a little bit more easier and, um, you know, give you reasons to support uh, getting involved. So great. Well, I thank you so much, both of you. I want everyone just a virtual round of applause um, for Melanie and, and Sarah again. Um, this was a really great discussion. I also want to thank um, all the partners that kind of joined us in launching this agenda. 
National Heart Association, uh, American Heart Association, National Partnership for Women and Families, Third Way, NCL. Um, I want to thank Catherine again for sharing her story and experience. And of course, thank everyone who joined today and engaged in questions and for all the work you're doing every day to center consumers and patients in health system reforms. This work is ongoing. We need to make sure that consumer and patient representatives, as we've kind of already laid out, are talking to CMMI about payment models or weighing in with legislators on the importance of investing in community-based care and primary care, behavioral health, the list goes on. So thank you again. We'll stay in close contact um, with everyone today. Um, if you know a colleague wasn't on this webinar and would like more information, please be in touch. I think we, we left a, uh, a form in the chat for that. So um, thank you again, and um, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks Sarah. All. And thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Bye, all.